Awesome. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Wesley, and uh, this is the section AI regulation and the EU AI Act. And we are gonna start the presentation with uh, Giada uh, from Hugging Face about stronger together on the articulation of ethical, correct, uh, ethical chatters, legal tools, and technical documentation in ML. Hi, everyone. So, um, several tools exist nowadays to guide AI development and deployment in different disciplines. And so, among them, of course, there are more of them. We can name ethical frameworks or any kind of code of ethics, licenses and regulations, and technical documentation, such as uh, model and data cards. And so the argument of our paper is to say that there are really interesting interactions and interdependencies that exist between philosophy, and so in that case, ethics, namely, law, and computer science. So we can start by giving some definitions, especially when we talk about different notions of compliance. And uh, so namely, we have ethical compliance, legal compliance, and technical compliance, which are separate, but also complementary. So when it comes to ethical compliance, it usually involves uh, the detailed articulation of principles or values that are enshrined on an ethical charter. And this specific articulation uh, catalyzes direct moral responsibilities from the people who drafted and signed that same ethical charter. Um, after, we have the notion of legal compliance. And so it involves ensuring that AI systems complied with relevant laws and regulations. And it involves usually a social articulation between business and authorities, so namely for instance, for a contract, when signing a contract. Last but not least, when it comes to technical compliance, so it involves ensuring that AI systems meet technical standards and specifications. And so by doing that, it ensures that AI systems are reliable, safe, and explainable from a technical point of view. So if we try to kind of summarize just by giving a small question, what's the role of ethics, law, and computer science when we want to deploy and develop uh, responsibly AI systems? So we can say that coming from the ethical compliance, it tried to answer the question, how will this technology be used? In what way? What's the right way to do it? Coming from the legal perspective, and so the legal compliance, it tries to answer the question, how shall this technology be used? And then finally, regarding technical compliance, it tries to answer the question, how can this technology be used? So based, of course, on its technical specifications. And so if we want to try to put all of this in a pretty figure, we can see that all those three different notions of compliance interact with each other, so all the three different disciplines. And they can also be described by their normative, prescriptive, and descriptive role. And so when it comes to the normative uh, component, we can see that the example that we took of the tool of ethical charters, for instance, it's mainly based on its normative aspect. And so it expressed the values that are drafted on the ethical charter, which aim to define um, the priorities of the specific AI system. And so this normative component, we can see also in the, in the table, that influences both the prescriptive and the descriptive aspects. So those are the small dot lines. And so those same values are going to inform both the prescriptive and the descriptive uh, articulation. So when it comes to the prescriptive part of this uh, articulation, um, it pertains what uses of an ML artifact are um, allowed or prohibited, and that's what mainly prescriptive means, based on the values that are 
uh, expressed in the ethical charter, so at the very beginning of the articulation. And so last but not least, we also see that the descriptive component it relates uh, to reporting the capabilities, so from a main, mainly technical perspective, and possible failures of a specific ML artifact. So once again, strictly from a technical perspective, and so it includes extensive documentation, such as model and data cards, which inform what potential harms and rights violation need to be addressed in licenses and regulation. And so we can see here how there's this kind of movement coming from the ethical charter, so those values are kind of enshrined on this technical documentation, descriptive component, and then ML licensing, and those same te technical documentation, because it frames also the technical limitation of a specific ML artifact, it's going also to inform regulation and licensing, and those same regulations, if they become standards, for instance, are also going to go back to technical, to the technical documentation, and so to the descriptive compliance. So let's, we saw what does, what all of this means um, in theory, and let's try to give a specific example. So. Um, the big science workshop had all those three notions of compliance, as we will see. But what's big science? So it was an open science project which aimed to develop and deploy a multilingual large language model called Bloom and its multilingual data set called Roots. So it was a large scale collaborative effort because it saw the participation and engagement of over a thousand researchers coming from all different languages and all different disciplines. And so all this wide range of different disciplines were interacting with each other and having the same goals. Um, so ethical charter responsible AE licenses and model cards, how they were interacting in practice in this, uh, in this example. So, this, those three notions of compliance, um, they interacted through, of course, an ethical charter. As we saw, it was kind of the, the, the starting point. And so through a consensus-based approach, uh, the big, size col big science collaborators described and outlined uh, the project intrinsic values. And those same values inform the development of the rail appendix, which is user restrictions, and also, therefore, the Bloom's model card. And so that's how we could say those same values have been operationalized through those two different aspects and compliances. Let's give a very briefly an example of values. So the intrinsic value, for instance, of reproducibility has first been described in the ethical charter. Then it has been expressed through an open license because, of course, we want the whole community to reproduce the results and the same experiments of the project. And last but not least, operationalized by the technical documentation. In order to, of course, reproduce uh, the project, we also have to know what kind of hardware we need, et cetera, et cetera. Or, again, uh, we also have the extrinsic value of multilingualism. It's a value because it lays the foundation of the project, so it's kind of the one of the main uh, goals. It was for the language model to be multilingual, and it has be it can be seen as a technical feature, because of course we need multilingual data if we want to make a multilingual large language model. So. Uh, also, the EUA Act and model cards can also interact with each other. So the last draft of the EUA Act refers to model cards as sources of documentation, and so we can also see those kind of movements. It is also a match between the info required by regulation and the information that is also expected from the AI community. And so we can say that there's potential for model cards to become regulatory compliance tools in the future. So, if we want to start to conclude, AI, we all know, is an interdisciplinary field and has interdependent notions, as we can also, also see here in fact. And so when it comes to a specific ML artifact or an AI system development and deployment, we need broader collaboration and interdisciplinary initiatives. 
some of the limitations of our research is that being proactive instead of reactive it can be super hard, especially when it comes to AI. And of course, balancing competing values and priorities for a project can also be very challenging. And so in conclusion, all interdisciplinary AI fields uh, need to work jointly, but how? Uh, we argue that they need to develop practical tools and methods for integrating ethical, legal, and technical compliance into AI development processes. And so ethical, legal, and technical compliance can be, they, three of them can be considered in isolation in this specific context, but we argue that they're definitely stronger together. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for a fully amazing talk. Um, next, we have Harsh from IDPAT um, giving talk on to be high risk or not to be semantic specifications and applications of the AIX high risk AI applications and harmonized standards. Take it away. Seems to be the theme to have long names uh, of authors and titles in this paper. Uh, so hi, I'm Harsh, I'm an assistant professor at Dublin City University, and I'm presenting this research which is led by Delarm, who's doing a PhD on this topic. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here due to visa issues, so I'm presenting on her behalf. So if you don't know about the AI Act, here is a brief summary. It basically is a regulation that will talk about two key entities, the AI providers and the AI users. The providers are the one who actually develop the AI system and provide it, and the users are the one who actually... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no worries. Thanks. Okay, sorry for the interruption. And the users are the one who actually end up using the system in practice, so they will be the ones who operationalize this and put this in front of people. So all of this is basically based on a risk hierarchy. So at the bottom, there are some, some minimal risks, your codes of conduct, please do not do this, please take care of this. Then there are limited risks, which basically means that you need to be aware of things that may go wrong. Then there are high risks when your AI actually affects people's rights. And then there are, there are unacceptable risks. Your system cannot be used at all. So all of this is based on health, safety, and fundamental rights within the EU, where fundamental rights refers to the Carter of Fundamental Rights published by the European Union, and where all countries are bound to, to respect it. So when we come to the high-risk classification of AI under the AI Act, there are three different ways that your AI system can be high-risk. One, if it is operating in an already regulated area, for example, uh, safety systems, your, your power electrical systems, your hospitals, where there is existing regulation about how technology is used, or it is used as a safety component in a regulated area. So again, the same devices, for example, a car that is being driven by an automated AI system, where the AI determines whether it is safe to stop or start the car, or there is a list in Annex 3, which defines a lot of different situations which are categorized as high risk. So if you're in the first two areas, which are highly regulated areas, it's kind of clear that, okay, what you need to do. But when it comes to the arbitrary list defined in Annex 3, it is difficult to understand what exactly is meant by high risk. So when we sat down and read this, and it was very confusing, the questions that came up again and again is basically what information is needed to decide whether a certain given use case is high risk or not. And if it is high risk or if it is not high risk, how do we know that in the future when something changes, we need to check again whether we are high risk? And at the end, who is responsible for making this decision? Is it the user, the provider, the model developer, the data subject, who, who should be responsible? So when we sat down and went through the entire list of Annex 3, including all of its various changes throughout the ages, we basically identified five different systems which through various permutations and combinations seem to indicate whether a given use case is high risk or not. So this is the domain in which the AI system is used, the purpose of the AI system, the capability, so technique is another word for capability, the user of the AI system, and who is the AI subject? So who is the actual individual, the person who is affected by the AI system? To give you an example, if a law enforcement agency, which is a domain, law enforcement, uses an AI system uh, for performing behavior analysis, where the purpose is to assess whether you have past criminal behavior, 
uh, and this is used by law enforcement authority and is only used for individuals who are suspected of a crime, this is categorized as high risk. So an arbitrary statement of what is categorized as high risk is now broken down into five concepts. So rather than asking everybody, is your use case high risk, you can now ask five simple questions which will help you analyze, are you high risk or how close you are to being high risk? So based on this, we analyze the rest of the EI Act and all of its accompanying documents to create a comprehensive picture of what are the high-risk use cases defined by the EI Act and its corresponding documents. The diagram is a bit complex, so I will go um, into a certain slice only for the law enforcement agency. And this basically tells you that if you are a law enforcement authority and you want to do, for example, profiling, behavior analysis, emotion recognition, and you're using these uh, techniques to do things such as detecting criminal offenses, assessing personality traits, your use case is probably high risk and you should take care of, of how you are using the AI system. Based on these identified five concepts, we then scour the documents to identify what are the different types of concepts that are used. So what are the different purposes? What are the different domains? What are the different capabilities? What are the different actors defined in the AI Act, the impact assessment, all the precursors and postcursors to the regulation? And we found lots of different concepts which represent these, these uh, five basic concepts. So this became the form of a vocabulary which is helpful to describe your use case. So now you can express your use case using terms which are kind of identified in the regulation. So instead of directly throwing the regulation at someone, you can ask them, please tell us what is your purpose, please tell us what is the specific AI technique you're using, and then based on what they answer, you kind of determine how close they are to being high risk or what kind of obligations apply to them. So we identified some, some amount of concepts from the AI Act, from various ISO uh, standards on AI concepts and taxonomy, and AI Watch's taxonomy. So the AI Watch taxonomy is a comprehensive literature survey conducted by the EU when they were formulating the AI Act. So it contains different um, machine learning, NLP, neural net, as well as your ethical considerations into what is a good AI system and what are the issues of the AI system. So through this, we also identified your various risk sources, the consequences and impacts. So consequences are basically things that go wrong, and impacts are when there is actual harm to a person, as well as impacted areas and how to mitigate this. It's not very comprehensive work. It's just a start, but it's a good uh, indication of where this work is going in that there are taxonomies which can be identified and, and used to describe your use cases and connect it with the regulation. Based on this, we created a simple tool which basically allows someone to input what they're doing, again, the five simple concepts, and based on whether those five concepts were occurring within the AI Act the, in, in Annex 3, you basically get the answer whether it is high risk or not. So rather than you know, the answer being ask a lawyer whether I'm subject to the AI Act, now you have a, a very good, simple system of stating is my system a, a high risk under the AI Act or not. So this basically is the idea of how um, to connect a complex regulation to something easily digestible by AI developers or authorities who may not have all the information at hand. So even if you have only some information at the hand, the assumption is that an open world assumption where all the information is applicable. So if you say that I don't have a purpose for my AI system, it is general purpose, that means that it is satisfying all the purposes in the AI Act. So it means that it's probably high risk even if you do not explicitly state a purpose. Then we decided, okay, how do you next check when this decision has to be revisited? So there are two cases under which you are obliged to do this under the AI Act. One is what is called substantial modification. So again, the AI Act is kind of vague on what does this mean. So we re define it as saying, anytime this, there is a change to these five concepts, you, you, you need to recheck whether your system is high, case, uh, high risk or not. So if you change your domain, you change your purpose, you slightly change the way your AI technique works, you change the, the people who are exposed to the AI system, you should go again and revisit whether your system is high risk or not. And who is responsible for making this decision? Again, the AI Act has a lot of complexities about who is the AI provider and the AI user. So no, no clear answer here. But the good idea is that these obligations are directly tied to these five concepts of domain, purpose, capability, user, and subject. So if you know your answer to those, you know whether you're a provider or a user, and that should clarify whether it's your obligation to indicate whether your system or use case is high risk or not. So a lot of times under EU law, 
companies are caught unaware that they suddenly have become a data controller, in this case an AI provider. So identifying whether you are the one actually changing the purpose or not should help clarify this question as well. Oh. The last part is then how do we deal with standards uh, for determining what the use cases actually are, how the information is actually represented. So the AI Act itself relies on, on standards to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And this is a problem because these standards don't exist at this moment. They are under development in, in some shape and form, but again, we don't know how they're going to end up. So a lot of the compliance is basically whether we have the standards and whether we comply with them or not. So the next step was to take, okay, we identified these concepts and what standards exist for these specific concepts. And that allowed us to basically map the AI Act against the list of existing standards. So this table is in, in the paper, so I won't go over it in much detail. But this basically tells you how your risk management system how your risk governance system, your trustworthiness characteristics, your performance, your bias, there are corresponding standards for those in, in, in development within ISO and how they connect back to the AI Act and how they connect back to the five concepts. And again, this comes back to how to deal with making your high risk system either not high risk or making sure you mitigate the risks. So the future work is basically keeping on expanding this vocabulary, connecting it back with the existing other vocabularies in the machine learning community, in the NLP community, in the ethics community, through engagement with these communities, as well as defining specific extensions for domains such as healthcare, which are very high risk areas. And then using this knowledge to develop tools that allow people to determine high risk and AI legal obligations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harsh, for the very solid work and great presentation. So next we have Cecilia um, sharing work on the role of explanation, explainable AI in the context of the AI Act. And let me help you to make this full screen. Oh, how do we make this full screen? Can the Sorry. So hello everyone, uh, I am Cecilia Panigutti and I am a researcher at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission in Ispra, in Italy. And today we present the paper, The Role of Explainable AI in the Context of the AI Act. So this, was, this is the result of the efforts of an interdisciplinary teams of computer scientists like myself and legal and policy officers of the European Commission. So in the past years, there has been a growing concern over the opacity of certain widely adopted artificial intelligence systems. And this concern has become a central theme in the development of digital policies and regulation worldwide. The need for transparency and explainability in AI has prompted intense discussion on the actual technical implication of these policies and regulations. In 2021, the European Commission introduced the AI Act, a proposal for regulating AI systems in the European Union. So the AI Act, as it was explained <laughs> in the past paper, um, adopts a risk-based approach, um, and AI systems are categorized based on their risk level, considering their context of use, and potential impact on health, safety, and fundamental rights. Notably, high-risk AI systems are subject to specific requirements, including transparency and human oversight. In this paper, we discuss the AI Act intent and expectations regarding transparency and human oversight for high-risk AI systems and the role of explainable AI tools in this context. So is it true that the AI Act will ban black box AI system uh, from the European Union? Is the use of explainable AI tools required by the AI Act? First, a few considerations on terminology. Our paper delves into the realm of explainable AI and the concept of black box AI models. 
When we say black box AI models, we refer to technically complex models that are difficult for humans to understand. The opposite of that are transparent by design models. Explainable AI aims to develop techniques to make the decision-making process of black box AI models more transparent and human interpretable. So the AI Act addresses the opacity of certain AI systems, notably those classified as high risk, through a focus on transparency and human oversight. The transparency requirement is in Article 13, and it states that high-risk AI systems should be designed and developed in a way that ensures that their operation is transparent enough for users to interpret and use the system's output appropriately. While some interpret this as a demand for transparent by design models, Article 13 specifies the system should be accompanied by instruction for use, providing concise, complete, correct, and clear information that is relevant, accessible, and understandable. In other words, the AI Act aims to achieve transparency through the provision of relevant documentation and information to the user, rather than enforcing transparent by design models or a mandatory use of explainable AI tools. Article 14 of the AI Act establishes the human oversight requirements for high-risk AI systems, aiming to enable effective supervision by natural persons during system use to prevent and minimize residual risks. Among others, Article 14 also emphasizes the importance of user interpretation of AI outputs and outlines measures such as designing suitable human AI interfaces, ensuring system responsiveness to humans' operator, and assigning competent, trained, and authorized individuals to fulfill this role. In addition, according to the AI Act, the trustworthiness of AI systems goes beyond the transparency and human oversight requirements per se. Providers should assess the combined effective interaction of all of the AI Act requirements, taking into consideration the state of the art. Article 9 on risk management explicitly recognizes this need. Thus, the earlier discussed transparency and human oversight requirements should be implemented in alignment with the risk management systems. So, while, while the AI Act does not speci specify the use of any particular technical tool, it does not restr restrict the use of explainable AI either. Actually, further research in this field is advisable. In this paper, we have identified some limitation of current explainable AI research that needs to be tackled to effectively address challenges related to AI opacity. We have identified three key limitations. First, AI explanation can be unreliable and not robust, making them vulnerable to adversarial perturbations and manipulations. Second, explanation evaluation is complicated by the lack of standardized metrics and the lack of a ground truth. And finally, the relationship between AI explanation and trust is underexplored, with some studies even suggesting that such explanation might increase automation bias. Moving beyond explainable AI, we can demonstrate that transparency and human oversight measures are not exclusively dependent on explainable AI tools. We will now provide some examples of such measures for an AI-based proctoring system that do not rely on explainable AI tools or transparent by design models. AI-based student proctoring systems are used to monitor and detect suspicious behavior during tests. In our mock-up use case, the system employs a black box algorithms that perform facial behavior analysis. This is shown on the screen right now. Uh, and this algorithm can infer high level information such as fa facial microexpression, gaze direction, and head pose. We will now showcase an illustrative and non exhaustive sample of measures that providers can identify to, um, and implement to address the transparency and human oversight requirements of the AI Act without necessarily using transparent by design or explainable AI techniques. So, first of all, the provider of the AI system ensures clarity by explicitly stating the intended purpose of the system, which is to detect suspicious behavior during tests. The system is also accompanied by relevant documentation and instruction for use. As the designated overseer of the system, the teacher, receives specific training on its typical failure modes, especially false positive that could harm student reputation and career. The system interface visually presents the extracted facial information. 
It objectively analyzes facial behavior using facial landmarks, head pose, and gaze direction. Rather than using binary yes or no labels for detective cheating, the system quantifies facial behavior through action units and intensity values. This approach encourages active engagement from the teacher, preventing automation bias. The AI proctoring system provides an intuitive and controllable interface. It displays all system outputs, including confidence values, enabling the teacher to make informed decisions based on visualized data. If cheating is detected, multiple individuals can inspect the alerts and the corresponding frames. Also, the affected student has the opportunity to communicate with the teacher during or after the test to explain their behavior. In summary, the presented system integrates various measures to address transparency and human oversight requirements effectively. These measures include comprehensive documentation system use, training for teachers to handle false positive, an interactive interface for active engagement involving multiple individuals for inspection and enable controllability and intervenability. In conclusion, the AI Act tackles AI opacity with an holistic approach by considering trustworthiness as a result of the interconnected attribute within AI systems. It provides flexibility in dealing with AI opacity, allowing providers and users to design compliance measures without mandating specific tools. And importantly, the AI Act does not impose a ban on AI systems. Thank you. Thank you so much for the um, very interesting work in the intersection of XAI and um, AI Act. Next, uh, we have a um, remote presentation, which I will start the video right now. It is about regulating ChatGPT and other language generative AI models by Philip. Hi, everyone. We're excited to present our paper, Regulating ChatGPT and Other Large Generative AI Models at ACM FAC 2023. In fact, the last couple of weeks and months have seen not only tremendous breakthroughs in the technical domain concerning generative AI systems, but also in the political process. Generative AI. Hi, everyone. We're excited to present our paper, Regulating ChatGPT and Other Large Generative AI Models at ACM FAC 2023. In fact, the last couple of weeks and months have seen not only tremendous breakthroughs in the technical domain concerning generative AI systems, but also in the political process. Generative AI is the main obstacle that is responsible for the European AI Act not being enacted yet. And the last days, in fact, have seen a breakthrough at the political level in the European Parliament. Now, we will try to map out some of the main regulatory challenges with respect to generative AI in this short presentation, starting with model regulation and a short glimpse at the European AI Act, then moving over to content regulation and the Digital Services Act, which we think is the perhaps even more important topic. In a third step, we will briefly touch on data protection and the GDPR before we sketch out some policy proposals at the very end. So let's get started with some thoughts on the European AI Act. And in fact, what we have here is a new provision that was just uh, built into a compromise in April 2023 in the European Parliament that specifically addresses what is now called in the legal text a foundation model. What is a foundation model? Well, um, it is a term that is taken over from the computer science literature, actually from the group of Percy Young and Stanford, and is defined as an AI model that's trained on broad data at scale, designed for generality of output, and can be adapted to a wide range of distinctive tasks. We believe actually that this term is much better suited than the more vague and loose term of gener a general purpose AI systems to capture the essentials of ChatGPT, Palm 2, and Luminous and other systems that we're here talking about. And so um, we think that this is actually a good step forward, but we should also mention that our foundation models generally cover the large generative AI models that we will be talking about during this presentation. So now what is the European Parliament version 
say about foundation models. It has a number of fairly useful um, formats and regulatory layers, but there's one major point that could potentially derail AI development and deployment in the EU and elsewhere, and that is a comprehensive risk management system. So what the European Parliament envisions is that a foundation model that can be used, of course, for all kinds of different purposes in high-risk scenarios, such as employment, medicine, credit scoring, law enforcement, and so on, that the model itself, or the developers of the model, they have to engage in a risk assessment and mitigation exercise and design a risk management system for all possible high-risk purposes with respect to fundamental rights, health, safety, the environment, democracy, and the rule of law. Now, this is, of course, laudable, but it becomes really difficult when you think about the potential use cases, thousands of them, of a single model like GPT-4 in all of these different areas with respect to all of these different uh, high-risk uh, settings. So we believe that, in a nutshell, in the AI Act and still with the European Parliament version, and much more even so with the version of the European Council that was passed in uh, December 6, 2022, we have a severe risk of overregulation. And that is problematic because already we have a fairly concentrated market with only Microsoft and Google really competing for the largest shares in the West, at least. And if we have such a comprehensive risk management system for thousands of hypothetical use cases, the risk is that the compliance costs will be nearly prohibitive for SMEs trying to uh, bring their own models onto the market and um, using them in the EU. So that is one pain point. And the other problem we believe is that the real issue with large generative AI systems and the real danger lies in disrupting our democratic discourses, in automating hate speech campaigns and fake news. We've already seen uh, cases where a law professor was uh, accused by ChatGPT of sexual harassment, totally without foundation. And hence here we believe the regulation is truly out of focus because instead of looking at the AI Act, we should much uh, rather look more specifically at the Digital Services Act in the EU and at other regulation curbing automated or curbing hate speech more generally and fake news around the world. And this is what the second part of the presentation will be on. And we will take these two images to further illustrate the dangers of AI-generated content and how it can deceive us. One image shows a fake mugshot of Donald Trump, and one can easily imagine how such images could be used in political campaigns. The other image shows the Pope in a very flashy down coat, and this image did go viral for some days until be people became aware it was not a picture of a real incident, but AI-generated. And to stem the tide of such fake news and misinformation online, the EU has recently enacted a regulatory instrument, the Digital Services Act, or DSA. Its goal is to mitigate harmful speech online and to balance freedom of expression and information at the same time. And to do so, it regulates intermediary services and uses several regulatory techniques. In particular, it requires notice and action mechanisms the registration of trusted flaggers, and for very large online platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok, compliance and risk management systems. However, these rules do not apply to L game generated content per se. The DSA only applies to intermediary services, which can be mere conduit services, caching services, or hosting services. For L games, only the last category could theoretically be relevant. However, L games provide content themselves, so they are not hosting services. And so the DSA does not apply to L games per se. And hence, in the field of misinformation and harmful speech, while we have an instrument, it does not apply and we see a risk of under-regulation. So the third regulatory field that we have to cover is data protection law. Um, and that topic is mostly covered by the technical report um, that is attached to our paper. And um, in recent days, it has um, gained quite a lot of media attention due to the Italian Data Protection Authority uh, banning ChatGPT from Italy. Um, and ChatGPT um, raises 
several data protection issues because it processes personal data first for training the data set or for um, compiling the data set um, or it scrapes data from the internet and um, later on when they also process the prompts that users enter. Um, especially when collecting the training data, um, the data subjects must be informed um, under certain circumstances which raises issues and then the most crucial issue of all is um, all processing of personal data in the EU requires a legal basis and it's just not very certain on which legal basis one can rely on when um, building such a model. And furthermore, in Italy there was um, a problem with the protection of minors and um, at the moment um, ChatGPT has made some concessions to the Italian regulators um, that allow ChatGPT to um, be used in Italy at the moment but the big questions have not been resolved and um, we touch upon them in our technical report. Thank you, Marco. And there's certainly uh, more research necessary concerning specifically the GDPR dimensions of uh, OpenAI's and other generative AI systems. I believe uh, would be a good way to structure the debate is to look at three different levels of regulation when it comes to foundation models or L games. So the first one should be minimum standards that apply to all L games, basically standards that the developers themselves, like OpenAI, like Google or DeepMind, have to fulfill. And that goes beyond the mere E of EU and other laws. Of course, the GDPR applies and non-discrimination law applies. But we also think that there should be certain transparency rules that we spell out in the paper that, uh, moreover, there should be selected data, data governance duties such that the training data set, for example, is not only composed of uh, white middle-aged males such as ourselves, and um, also cybersecurity provisions, which of course have become increasingly important in the, uh, in the contested geopolitical environment of the moment. All of these um, minimum requirements that we've talked about until here are actually addressed and in the latest European Parliament proposal. But there's one that is specifically missing, and that is the uh, expansion of content moderation of the DSA framework that we've seen with trusted flaggers and notice and action mechanisms that ensure that developers have to react if, for example, uh, users find out that certain prompts actually lead to output of how to manufacture a biological bomb or how to generate a you know a dialogue between Hitler and Goebbels with illegal content. These rules have not been uh, transposed to uh, large generative AI models, and here we see a real danger and an absolute need for action. The second level then are use case specific rules. If you take these models, adapt them, and use them in specific high risk use cases, medicine, you know, uh, employment, you name it, then we believe, but only then you should be required to conduct a risk management assessment and to implement risk management systems for this specific mechanism and use case. And finally, uh, we need rules for the AI value chain. And this is also something that is contemplated in the uh, European Parliament Act or, or version, uh, whereby we mean that none of the actors, the original developers, such as OpenAI, any deployers in between that fine tune the model for specific use cases and professional users, none of them usually have all the information necessary for full EU AI compliance. And hence here we need uh, access and information rights that at the same time respect, of course, to a certain extent, uh, trade secrets and IP rights. We also going forward need sustainability rules, but time's up already. And we'd like to thank you for attention and look forward to the discussion and to the new developments that we will see, certainly see not only in the technical, but also in the regulatory field concerning generative AI. Many thanks. Great. Our final presentation from Jennifer from University of Cambridge on understanding accountability in algorithmic supply chains. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer Cobb. I'm here presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Michael Veal and Jat Singh. Um, and I'm going to talk about understanding accountability in algorithmic supply chains. Um, so I'll explain what they are, I'll describe their key features, uh, I'll discuss some of the implications for algorithmic accountability, 
um, which we understand as a mechanism for challenging power and for protecting people um, and societies. And I'll argue that algorithmic accountability must attend to the dynamics of supply chains uh, and the challenges that they raise. Um, so algorithmic accountability research increasingly seeks to understand the process of developing, deploying, and using algorithmic systems. Uh, this research has sought or proposed ways of understanding specific stages in the algorithmic life cycle, such as things like um, data sheets or model cards or system cards, or they might seek to integrate such mechanisms into a coherent framework um, that works across the life cycle, such as our own previous work on reviewability and work by others on auditability and traceability. Now, this work is often reflected assumptions, which are implicit or otherwise, that the organization developing an algorithmic system will be the one that deploys it. Um, bit too ahead of myself. The tools which have been proposed are useful, um, but this focus on systems deployed uh, and developed and deployed by one organization um, is insufficient to deal with these issues. Um, in fact, production and distribution of algorithmic systems is now often organized around data-driven algorithmic supply chains. Um, and in these, multiple actors together contribute to and control different aspects of developing, uh, deploying, using, and the functionality of AI technologies. And this reflects the rise of cloud computing and the modular nature of computing resources um, distributed as services. Um, where, deploy, where developers might once have integrated components into a system controlled by them, they now delegate control over the underlying technologies uh, in supply chains to others. So rather than a system, digital technologies, including many algorithmic systems, often now work through a system of systems, a data-driven supply chain in which outcomes and functionalities result from the working together of multiple actors and organizations. And this could be hardware capabilities or software functionalities or commercial or industrial processes or indeed AI decisions and outputs. Um, so supply chains are data-driven. Um, in that the flow of data from actor to actor links systems and makes functionality possible. So component systems themselves have supply chains, producing complex chains of actors linked by data flows between systems they control. So in this example of an algorithmic supply chain, there is an input by the end user of a mobile application, um, which triggers data flows to an AI service with its own supply chain. Um, and the AI service's outputs then pass through several other actors before data finally comes back to the mobile application to produce some kind of functionality for the end user. Um, algorithmic supply chains often involve AI services, um, which have kind of been discussed so far, uh, where a provider offers access over the internet to models that they control. And these provide functionalities that customers uh, can integrate into their applications. Developing advanced AI technologies needs advanced technical skills, it needs a lot of resources, and it needs data that many organizations lack. But AI services offer relatively easy access to powerful models at low cost. The bigger providers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google offer numerous AI systems right across these kinds of categories. And then some cases now begin to act as intermediaries through which smaller providers' models can also be accessed as services. Um, smaller providers themselves typically specialize in one or two specific kinds of technology, like facial recognition services or generative services. Um, several features of algorithmic supply chains challenge organization-focused approaches to accountability. First, the actors in supply chains are interdependent. One actor might produce data sets for system development. A second actor might be an AI service provider, might produce the system using that data and then offer it as a service. A third actor, the provider's customer, might then use that service deploying the system in their application. And a fourth, which would be the application's end user, might then actually use that system in a particular context, sending data back to the provider uh, for processing. So different aspects of production, deployment, and use of algorithmic systems are split between multiple actors linked by data flows, and each actor thus depends on the uh, actions of others. They might not know about each other, but their interdependence means that the supply chain context is absolutely crucial for understanding these actors' activities and their role in the workings and effects of AI technologies. 
This also means that problems can cascade, cascade easily through supply chains um, because customers depend on a provider system for functionality in their application, uh, for example. Any bias in that system will be inherited by their application. So problems with one actor can propagate to others in a given chain in complex and unpredictable ways, as well as across the various chains where that one actor, uh, where those actors might operate. Um, it's also important to note that these inter interdependencies are usually asymmetric. Um, certain actors are core players in supply chains because they do things that lots of other actors sort of disproportionately rely on, which produces asymmetric balances of power, um, which typically benefit those core actors. Um, a second problem to consider in relation to these things is that they are transient and dynamic. They come into existence when functionality is requested, and through the supply chain, there might be multiple different directions for data to flow, depending on the results of the data's processing. So the structure of supply chains and the actors involved might change each time they're instantiated, and it might be only fully apparent once the outcome has been produced. So, Though certain actors, so this is the case, certain actors might have sort of ongoing bilateral legal, technical, or other sort of economic relations with each other. Third, as some of our previous research has shown, supply chains are increasingly consolidating around a few key actors, um, primarily Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, but also some others. Uh, these providers offer infrastructural and user-facing services across many different market sectors, and they also produce their own AI technologies and distribute them through those services. Together, they're the biggest players in the cloud infrastructure market and in AI services, and the technological requirements for developing state-of-the-art AI technologies mean that their cloud services are crucial for many specialist providers. So even someone like OpenAI uses a major provider's infrastructure for production of their technologies, and then distributes that through the cloud interface, and in that case, it's Microsoft. So some specialist providers also use one cloud provider's infrastructure for development and then another cloud provider's um, services for distribution. So even open source models will often then run on a major provider's infrastructure for these reasons. So as well as being core players in many supply chains, the major providers are also systemically important for the political economy, governance and accountability of AI more generally. So together, the features of supply chains um, that I've described raise important challenges for algorithmic accountability. Um, a first challenge is um, the accountability horizon, oh, sorry, no, the distributed responsibility um, in algorithmic supply chains. Um, different actors control different aspects of supply chains, um, such as production, deployment, and use of algorithmic systems. Not all actors in supply chains are responsible for their outcomes. Some will only uh, provide supporting services. Nor will all actors who are in some way responsible be equally responsible. Some of them will play bigger roles than others in determining outcomes and producing functionalities. Um, but responsibility for the workings and outcomes of supply chains is distributed with no one actor in overall control, which means it's really important to identify who is factually responsible for which aspects of supply chains and to then allocate accountability based on a proper understanding of their dynamics. Because if you direct, say, production-related accountability obligations to people who are responsible for deployment, you're probably not going to actually get very far with that. Um, a second significant challenge is the accountability horizon in data-driven supply chains. Um, that's the point up or down the chain that an individual actor can't really see beyond. So that's illustrated here um, in blue for the actor A. Most actors in supply chains will know who they interact with directly. They might have some information about an actor's maybe another step away, but they'll often have no way of knowing um, about supply chains kind of beyond that. And distributed responsibility means that they'll typically have incomplete information um, about aspects of the production and deployment that they're not responsible for. Um, so that makes things like risk management and problem framing extremely difficult to do in these supply chains and challenges those mechanisms in things like the AI Act. Um, in some cases, it might be effectively impossible to do the kind of risk management that, <coughs> that the AI Act um, says that you should be doing. Um, so I think several things are needed to improve accountability in algorithmic supply chains. Um, first, we need criteria for identifying the distribution of responsibilities between actors, particularly where certain actors are core to, to particular chains or are systemically important more generally. Um, we also need processes for allocating accountability accordingly for the right activities with the right consequences. Second, um, 
we need legal, organisational and technical mechanisms for expanding the accountability horizon, such as we proposed in our work on decision providence for tracking data flows through these supply chains. Um, these kinds of mechanisms would help bring better understanding of the actors and interdependencies involved, um, both for those within them and for external actors trying to sort of oversee them. We also need interventions to try to restrict or condition the power of providers to control other actors in supply chains through their APIs or through their terms of service. Um, and we need to try to do that, I think, quite quickly because we see different providers trying to structure supply chains pretty much entirely for their benefit. And that's, I think, not necessarily a desirable thing. So I think in all, if governance and accountability mechanisms are to properly contend with the algorithmic um, systems and AI technologies of the future, and if people and societies are going to be properly protected, then the dynamics of supply chains must be properly understood and their implications for algorithmic accountability have to be um, urgently addressed. And I would say that none of the laws that people have talked about today, including the AI Act or the DSA or GDPR or even the DMA, come even close to dealing with these issues. It's, we're going to have to fix everything in about five years' time. It's a complete mess. Thank you very much. Very nice closing, Jennifer. So let's welcome back uh, all the um, presenters. Um, and then we are opening up for any questions. And if you have any questions, feel free to line up there at the speaker. Um, this is the last session for, for today. So I think we can go over time a little bit because um, we do only have five minutes um, left. Hi, my name is Mark, and I work at Duke Health, and I love the last presentation. I'm going to dive in. So I, in my industry, the, the powerful player is the, the infrastructure of the health record. And then you have these third-party apps building specialized solutions, integrating. It's an environment where no one wants to take responsibility over the outputs of these solutions. and there's actually legal structures that say that the, well, the, the physician's the expert, so they should just be able to handle what comes out at the very end. So I, I'm curious when you're, when the organizations are consuming a multiple components, but th the solution providers don't want to clearly delineate accountability amongst themselves, and then the consuming organization does not have the expertise to then say which component is failing where. Like, what actor, because I, I just can't imagine like the industry players are just gonna want to sit down and figure this out together. Like, what, what do you see as potential mechanisms from regulators or some other third party? The answer to that question is that I don't have any faith whatsoever in industry actors to do anything for anyone's benefit other than themselves. But I think what we see is we need we need laws, we need regulations to to force them to do these things. We need to provide incentive structures that mean that it is in their benefit to do it as much as for anyone else's benefit. This is why I think the AI Act has been a missed opportunity, simply because it does not do that. It doesn't recognize these kind of dynamics. It doesn't make sure that we're allocating accountability in this kind of way to force these kind of actors to do the things they need to do to provide the information they need to provide in ways that allow people to understand what's happening. But I guess, like, I imagine modular software and technology there's has existed for a long time yeah. with integrating components. Like, are there, at least in other cases, historically, where this has happened? So one of the differences between this and modular software components sort of way of doing things is that if you integrate software components into a system that's overall still controlled by you, you can be held responsible for how you've gone about doing that. In this case, you're delegating that control to these other actors. So it's very difficult to put any kind of level of accountability for you on you, sorry, for what those other actors are doing, which is one of the reasons why the laws that we have just don't really contend with this because they kind of like they were written at a time, or GDPR, for example, was written at a time when nobody had, well, cloud had just begun to be a thing and, and the commission just pretended it wasn't happening because they wanted to get their law through. And it seems like they've basically done the same thing with the AI Act. They've just kind of pretended this isn't really happening and, and gone ahead and, and done what they wanted to do anyway. So we're in a different paradigm and we need to find laws um, to address that, I think. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm actually going to follow up on Mark's question right there. Uh, same same topic. I also work for a company that is both a vendor and a provider, and is very interested in this particular question, but operates almost mostly in the U.S. And so, even if all of the laws that we talked about today go into effect in Europe, they're probably not going to affect us. And so, the the organization I work for is is more coming from the the take of like they think it's going to be worked out in the legal system. And so, I was curious if you had any thoughts on rather than um, the creation of new laws, they're wondering if the uh, reading of existing laws will lead to legislation that will involve them getting sued for something that happens much further down the line. Do you have any thoughts on that perspective? I, I can't speak specifically to the U.S. because I'm not generally familiar with U.S. Uh, law, but I think there are... Pr Look, part of the problem with this is that if you if you don't have mechanisms to identify which actors are doing what sort of deeper within these supply chains, it's extremely difficult to know how to leverage existing laws to get at them. Um, so without those kind of transparency mechanisms, which we need to be able to understand these things, it's going to be hard to do. But that's not to say that it's impossible. But it would need a systematic way of trying to investigate. More, so we've done research in trying to understand what happens to these supply chains past like one or two steps. It's very, very difficult to get to get any further than that. And that's even with European legal mechanisms that in theory allow you to have transparency. Um, so without those mechanisms, it's going to be very hard, but that's not to say it's impossible. But finding out the, the fundamental precondition for challenging these things or understanding these things or getting improved accountability in these things is understanding what's happening more than one step deep in the chain. And if you can do that, then that possibly opens up other avenues and other ways to address this. But if you can't do that, I don't know what legal mechanisms in the US in particular they would be um, to help you. Thanks. Uh, hi. Um, first, th thanks so much um, for these presentations. I know a lot about the UAI Act, and I just learned some more. Uh, so very impressed. Um, so I'm Alex Engler. I work at the Brookings Institution. I've worked extensively on a lot of these issues, and I, I take these uh, uh, criticisms of where the UAI Act is uh, very seriously, and, and would first, you know, encourage all of you to get involved in the trilogue uh, debate because there is still some uh, path to, to change parts of the Act. I do have. Um, I want to explain one part of why I think its approach to the value chain exists as it is and ask for some feedback. The current version of the, the Parliament version of AI Act's approach to the value chain is built around the idea that it is basically impossible or very hard in the period of time that they have to legislate the appropriate amount of responsibility across multiple actors in the many, many versions of the value chain that you can imagine in the many, many areas that are considered high risk. They basically functionally said, we can't do that. And, and I think, again, given that this bill, uh, for political reasons, will come out this year, will be done this year, that's probably true. So instead, what it does is it says, push information downstream to the people making the final decision that is doing the hiring or allowing the educational access, give them the information they need to make a fair system that meets the requirements, and then put the accountability there. Now, I think that is flawed in some ways, but it, is, it does exist for a reason. It's because this is a comprehensive sectoral specific, or sorry, not sectorally specific, not application specific bill. So I'm curious, in that context, do you still see these flaws, uh, and this is broadly for the last paper, thank you again, still see this as being totally kind of screwed? Which is a fair, it may be a fair criticism, it may just be unworkable. I just want to like give a little bit of context of why it's structured the way it is now. Um, and then I also have another sort of broader question, uh, which is, um, can algorithmic audits, which the AI Act is built around using from uh, market surveillance authorities, can they work in multi-organizational AI uh, supply chains? So, sort of a, so one reaction, I'd, I'd welcome anybody, and then on uh, audits as well. And thank you, again. Okay. Um, so I think I understand the, that the Commission felt that they had to get legislation on this done within a time frame, um, but that's a political choice, and that's their choice, and when this doesn't work, that'll be their fault, and I think we have to <laughs> remember that. Um, sure. So, I th but I also think what we, what we can do is, we also have to recognize that perhaps a general approach to regulating is not necessarily the best way to go about these things, because a lot of the problems we see coming up will depend on sector, so we perhaps also need sector-specific regulation. Um, but I think, so part of the problem with the AI Act is the way that it assigns who's going to be the provider, who's going to be the user in the system. And the, so in some cases it will work, 
in many cases, particularly where the actual harms are going to come up, where risks are going to come up, I think it won't work. And I'll tell you why I think it won't work. The reason why I think it won't work is that a provider of an AI service can say you can only use, say, this service in relation to these specific purposes. Otherwise, you're kind of beyond what we think. And if you then go back and do that, you're going to be, become the provider of the system in EU law. And we can say, well, they shouldn't do that because obviously then they're going to be a provider. They won't have the capability to make the system. Um, you know, uh, comply with the law, that's fine. But the factual, factual position is going to be that they are using that system in a way that doesn't comply with the law and people are being harmed by it. So we can sit about and say that they shouldn't do what the law says they shouldn't do, but they will do what the law says they shouldn't do, so we need to write the law in a way that reflects that. And we haven't written the law in a way that reflects that. We've just said, well, the law says this, but let's just hope that works out fine in the end. It doesn't work out fine in the end because people will use things in ways that, that, are, that, are, that change the intended purpose of systems and therefore become providers. Um, so for some systems, it'll be fine. For lots of systems, it simply won't. Um, and that's the Commission's political choice, and the Commission's going to have to take responsibility for that. Yeah, I, I will say I think it, there is a political... Uh, there is a, a way where this works, right? And I, again, I, I, I share some of these criticisms, and I'm not... This is a little bit devil's advocate. But the idea is that if you are that last company and you take a system that you cannot, because you don't understand the value chain, properly deploy it, then you are responsible for that, and you absolutely can enforce at that point. And so it creates an incentive to create value chains that are more traceable and do have more information providing transfers. Now, again, I'm not saying that's going to work, but I'm saying that I think it's not given quite enough credit to the idea that there is like a so enforcement you, structure that can be a match. You can potentially do that. Of course, you can begin to find which actors are using systems in ways that are causing harm, and when you try to enforce against them, you can discover that they're using them for unintended purposes, and therefore they're the provider. And even better, you can make them responsible for all sorts of, of things. That's great, but in the meantime, lots of people have been harmed. So what's the point of having the law in the first place? It doesn't actually stop, prevent the problem from coming up, so it, it's, it's pointless. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. So to, 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 to clarify what ap actually happens in practice, dial back five years ago, we got GDPR, which had a similar distribution of roles for controllers and processors. And in, in theory, the controller tells the processor what they're supposed to do. But in practice, what really happened was the big company just gave you a standard contract that you had to sign, and that, that's it. So even the company at the end, who in theory had all the control, didn't really have any control because they just got the system as is. So this is probably what's going to happen here. So as a counterpoint to the law defining the supply chain, I think the law just defines liability, uh, who, who, who to hold responsible and how do we you know, prevent the harms. And the rest of the fact is that the commission says, anytime a problem arises, we're gonna have more laws in the future that will deal with those. So this is a Band-Aid. To, to stop the bleeding, the, the bigger surgery is yet to happen, probably. Oh, we do, uh, we are at uh, the time, so if you wanna leave, feel free to leave, but I do have one last question for uh, all the presenter answers. So um, for uh, the next year or so, um, as researcher working in this area, what do you think um, FAT committee could contribute to this um, border area and what's your preferred future for this line of research here? Yeah. And I guess anyone can answer that. Yeah. You can just go in order. Yes, that's an interesting question. I would link this, my answer to one of the last questions that were posed. So defining what uh, and how an algorithm audit should be that's for sure uh, something that right now is something that is very research oriented only. And so it will be necessarily to be implemented in the real world. So, you know, coming up with, you know, some processes on how to do that, that would be very interesting to see from this community. Yeah, I mean, very briefly, I would say, and I completely agree. And I think the, also because it was the topic of my paper, I think the fact that fact is so transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary, I think it's going to be very knowledgeable for all policymakers, and not only in Europe, but really all over the world. My answer for what fact should do is on the screen right now. Um, I, I think the answer to that would be to improve upon what we currently have as best practices. They're best so far, but we need more, so to, to refine. 
Awesome. Let's give another round of applause for all the amazing presenters. And yeah, that's it for today. Uh, if you have any question, um, feel free to bring it offline, and the author, they may stay here longer, and you can free to chat.